Here is a list of 10 guns that I have bought before that I would not buy again. And I'm going to give you at least a couple of reasons why I would not buy them again. Hopefully, it will be useful to you if you are shopping for those types of guns, and that way you won't waste your money like I did. The first gun, the first one that I'd like to talk about is the Smith & Wesson 642. Whoa. You might be thinking, this is a really great gun. It's super reliable. It's generally pretty accurate. It can shoot the 38 Special Plus P, the old 642 or 442 Airway. Great guns. I've owned a couple of them, and I wouldn't own them again. They are just too lightweight for the 38 Special. I would definitely want to go with a gun that weighs three or four ounces more. When you have a gun that is this lightweight, recoil becomes unmanageable. And I'm somebody who has shot huge guns. Big Ruger Red Hawks, 44 Magnums, 357 Magnums. Even me, with the ability to try to hang on to those guns, has a very difficult time shooting a box of full house 158 grain 38 special loads. It's just not pleasant. And I can understand why you'd want one as a backup, but it is not fun to shoot. And I would definitely trust my life with one, but I wouldn't buy it again. Alternative to that, Ruger LCRX has a little bit better trigger and I find that the grip is engineered a little bit better that I would actually want to consider carrying it. I would also consider a bobbed SP-101. I think that those are good guns and it can shoot 357 as well. So I would consider doing a 2.75 inch SP-101 or a Ruger LCR or LCRX. Second on my list, another snub nose, the Smith & Wesson 351C. This is a 22 Magnum snub nose. While I think the 22 Magnum is a great round, especially with the Federal Punch defense loads, one of the problems that you run into with that is that it takes so much hammer force to ignite a 22 Magnum or a 22 long rifle reliably when combined with the super lightweight pistol and the super small grip that I wasn't able to shoot the gun accurately. I was not having a good time and frankly, it was only good as a get off of me type of gun. There's nothing wrong with it and it was always completely reliable. That being said, I wouldn't buy it again because for a pocket pistol, it wasn't exactly what I needed. It may be good for you, but in this case, my alternative would be the Ruger LCR in 22 Magnum, as I believe that the trigger is better and the grip is better. It's not as pretty, I will give you that. But the issue with 22 Magnum revolvers in snub nose, they are really expensive. My 351C was almost 700 bucks. So that being said, that's something to consider. <coughs> Third on my list, the CAR MK9. This was a dream gun of mine, and I really, really wanted it to be great. It's a single stack, all steel pistol. It is their all steel version of the PM9, which they are famous for. I found that this gun was very heavy. I had a hard time putting it in inside the waistband holsters because it would generally pull my pants down, much like a larger gun would. It was not as accurate as I would hope that it would be. And given the, the weight did decrease some of the recoil, the gun is very small. It was beautiful and I had a great time trying to shoot it, but I found out that it was not very reliable with defense loads. So that was something that made me a little disenfranchised with it, although I, I loved to have it and it was just so cool. Uh, and you can see my review on it. It just wasn't reliable enough for me to want again. You may see a future video from me about wanting to deal with smaller compact guns, maybe giving some reasons why I think people should just work on carrying bigger guns. The next one is the kel -Tec. PF9. That gun is interesting because it was a super compact single stack 9mm. kel -Tec had been coming up in the world when they had made this gun and so they were not necessarily known as making trash guns anymore. So I thought. One of the issues with this gun is that the way that the magazine release was designed, if you gripped the pistol too tight, it would drop the magazine out the bottom. It had a extended magazine that was generally more usable. Now, if you didn't use the gun with the extended magazine, it was very difficult because the bore axis is very high. It was also a double action only gun. So that made the gun very hard to shoot and it made it have very slow follow-up shots. And also when you combine with kel sort of shoddy reliability, it ended up being a gun that I would not buy again and I don't suggest for other people. 
if you are looking for a very small, maybe single stack 1911 style pistol or a defense gun like a Glock, I would definitely look at those first. I would look at something like the 938 or the Glock single stack micro compact or the Springfield XDS. I think that those have all been guns that I would much rather carry. If you want something that's premium and a single stack nine millimeter, go with the Sig Sauer Legion 938. Very cool gun, built a little bit off the backbone of the Colt Mustang, but in nine millimeter, and it'll shoot six or seven rounds. I do wanna make an honorable mention here because I don't wanna to try to bunch too many of the same type of gun. The Taurus 605. It is an all steel Smith & Wesson sort of copy. One of the issues with this gun is that I have always found the Taurus 605's light strike primers. If you don't use your federal primers or defense ammunition, getting the guns to fire on double action is a problem. They will always light on single action because the hammer has a little bit further to travel and has some more kinetic energy, but I do find that the Taurus 605, in my experience, gave me problems even if you try to send it back. That's just the way they're sprung. The next on this list is the Savage Axis rifle. This is one of those things where I really thought that the bargain and the value was going to be at a point at which it would have uh, a lot more return. I'll explain. I've worked with a Savage Axis in 6.5 Creedmoor that was incredibly hard to get dialed in. And generally speaking, the issues with Savage is not their accuracy. It's the clunkiness of their action, sometimes the cheaper qualities of their plastics. In this case, the plastics were fine, the trigger was fine. I could not get this gun to shoot accurately. And as a hand loader, that's frustrating. So one of the issues I came up with is a $279 gun is just not gonna be consistently accurate and reliable enough to give me what I would want. I was never able to get better than about one and a half inch groups out of it with just about any ammo. That may not be your experience with the Axis, but I don't think I would buy another one. I think I would spring for the Ruger American, which I think you can get for maybe a hundred to two hundred dollars more. You, you would find that it is worth that amount of money compared to the Savage Axis. I think you will probably like the stock a little better. The next one, Springfield Emissary 9mm. This gun was a disappointment. I thought it was going to be a dream gun of mine and I thought it was going to be perfect. It was so beautiful. It had a stealth fighter type of look. And you might see from a couple of my other videos that I was just not happy with it. One of the things that I think I had many issues with was its reliability and its issue with getting stuck on the disconnector and having to do some gunsmithing to make it reliable. By the time I was really done with it, the firing pin had let go and after replacing the firing pin, I had just decided I'm done with this gun. It is reliable and it works fine, but the magic has died. Instead, I would go for a gun that I think is much better in the category that it's in and costs less, which is the Kimber Pro Carry 2 in 9mm. It has the same elements, the bull barrel, the reverse guide spring for the recoil, as well as having a lot of the enhancements uh, over the GI style. We'll have a better trigger, we'll have good sights. I would definitely consider getting the Kimber Pro Carry 2 in 9mm. Compared to the Emissary, uh, I was just disappointed. And, and I think that if you want a compact 9mm bull barrel, there are better options that are cheaper. That gun being almost $1,300 when I bought it was just a big waste of money, and I'm sorry that I got it. Next one, another Springfield. Uh, I got a Springfield Garrison 1911. The reason that I didn't care much for this gun is that it was built in a very cheap feeling way. The trigger was really floppy. I found that the action was really loose and rattly. Uh, I found that just everything on the gun was fit really poorly and sloppily, if that's such a thing. The issue with that gun is that it was almost 800 bucks. Sometimes you can get them around 700, but I wanted a gun with a good finish on it. And really that's the only thing that I got. For a thousand, you can at least get a Colt. But in that case, I had a Springfield Garrison 1911 in blued in 45. And I felt like, generally speaking, one of the issues that I had with it was that while it had all the enhancements that modern 1911s have, it didn't shoot or feel any better than a much cheaper gun. So the reason I would not buy it again is that you can get a Tezos, a Rock Island perhaps, that has all of the exact same enhancements on them and it will probably shoot just as good, maybe even better because I wasn't great with that gun. So something to consider is that the reason I wouldn't buy that Springfield is because of the value. One of the reasons people buy Springfields is because they are made of very good steel. Tell you what though, Tezos is making steel that is so good that gunsmiths are having to anneal the metal so that they can machine it. 
I don't know to tell you something about the hardness of that Turkish steel. Generally speaking, I don't like to steer people away from American guns and towards foreign guns, but this is one of those situations where you can get a $450 Tezos 1911 and it will probably outshoot that $700 American Springfield Garrison. The next one that I have had issues with was any rifle or upper by Bear Creek Arsenal. I have personally had issues with their QC. I have personally had issues with their customer service and I wouldn't shoot it again. I had a Bear Creek Arsenal 6.5 Grendel upper that I ordered that I thought was gonna be great and it was shooting six inch groups. I sent it all the way back to Bear Creek and then they had dropped the upper and then dented the charging handle where it was actually bent and it made it harder to use. I decided I was gonna take it on myself and not send it back. I had a Saturn Liberty barrel installed by a local gunsmith and a couple other knickknacks. And the Saturn Liberty barrel was amazing, but the upper receiver was so loose that he had to put on so much barrel lapping compound and barrel epoxy compound to stick it in there that it would end up kind of squirting out the sides because there was so much gap. It was so out of spec. Now, that being said, could it have been the upper receiver the whole time? I don't know. But it took a gunsmith to make a $180 upper receiver shoot any good and, and a nice 5R match barrel. And the gun shot great after that. But I would never buy anything from them again just based on the customer service that I had received that they sent me back a gun that they had damaged that I had already bought. And so I, I don't think that I would buy from Bear Creek again. An alternative to a value AR-15 company, Anderson, Palmetto, and Radical. All of those companies have absolutely really come up in their quality. Palmetto is great because I've generally never heard anybody breaking Palmettos. They're not good, they're not bad. They just run. That's fine for the purpose that you need them for. You're not gonna get the highest level of barrel steel, but on all of these, you're not gonna get those either. Radicals are generally a good beater gun, and I've heard very few bad things about them, aside from when they were a brand new company. Andersons are coming up in the world, and for less than 500 bucks, you can get an entire AM-15 gun. I'd buy four or five of these at this point. I watched a YouTuber do a thousand round meltdown in full auto, and he didn't even melt the gas tube. So whatever Anderson's doing right now, you need to get on board before the prices go up. The next one that I would not buy is the Smith & Wesson SD9. SD9VE or Sigma. This is a Glock copy that Smith & Wesson had been sued over. The issue with these guns was always the trigger. And it was always very, very hard. It was gritty and it was difficult to use. Reliability on mine was not great. Although it was definitely up to par, it just wasn't as good as the Glock for sure. I think one of the issues that I had was that simply I wasn't able to really get much money out of it. It was a good deal when I bought it, but I will say that if you are going to spend $300, you have multiple options in the $300 range. Sometimes you can get a CZ P10C for $320, $330. Sometimes you can get a Ruger SD9 great gun to consider. And I would also consider a Taurus G2C or the G3. All of those are great guns when you consider that for about 300 bucks, you can get a dynamite gun for the same amount of money as that Smith & Wesson Sigma, which is not good, or the SD9. It's the same Sigma design. It's their Glock copy. The last one, and this is going to break some hearts, a gun that I owned two of and would not buy again, the HK USP 45. Yes, it's one of the coolest guns ever made. It's a slick shooting 45. It's gigantic in hand and it feels good and you just feel so cool when you shoot it. That being said, I had a batch of ammo that the gun wouldn't feed. I was told by just about everybody that this is the one gun that should feed anything, good ammo, bad ammo. When I was shooting this gun, I felt like I could not get it to feed as reliably as the claims. We had shot that same batch of ammo in 1911s and in an FNX 45, it all fed perfectly. I don't wanna have a temperamental gun that costs as much as that gun did. They're starting at 1100 bucks. Deal is when you have an inferior style gun that you have to get a light adapter for, for like the TLR-8, uh, that you have to get a special adapter for to put a light on, you have to get special holsters for. Really, if you're looking at carrying a big old stack of 45, there are better guns and cheaper guns. The FNX is a way, way better gun, and it doesn't cost as much. That being said, that gun was much more reliable in my hands. I also find that if I would get another gun, I'd probably get a Glock 21 short frame, or just a Glock 21 full frame, but both of those guns are gonna be better. And work with some conversion barrels, because that Glock 21 can shoot 10 millimeter, and it can also shoot things like 
a 45 Super and 460 Roland if you decided you wanted to go up into like bear territory. Yeah, USP 45 was a disappointment for me and I wouldn't spend the big money on it again when compared to the Glocks and other things that you could get. So that's my short list. I hope everyone's doing well. 